Hello. I'd like to welcome you all to the Institute of Politics tonight. My name is Avery Gardner, and I chair the Institute's Student Advisory Committee. I want to welcome you all down here tonight to meet our spring fellows and to welcome our fellows here to the Institute. This is one of our favorite events down here at the IOP where we get to get the first glimpse of our, of our fellows and what they're going to be doing with all of us over the course of the semester. So I hope that tonight will be an interesting one and that the semester will be an engaging one. And I'd like to turn it over to Phil Sharp, the director of the Institute, who will be our host for the evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Avery. We're delighted you're here. Uh, as is often the case at the Institute of Politics, we eat and talk and uh, uh, carry on in a traditional American uh, political fashion. So. Uh, don't hesitate to uh, stay at it. Uh, and uh, we hope you'll get a chance now to uh, uh, hear from our uh, fellows who are going to be with us for this semester and that you will seize the opportunity to attend uh, uh, some of their study groups uh, uh, throughout the semester. But more than that, uh, what I hope uh, you will feel comfortable at doing, and I know some of you from past experience are quite comfortable <coughs> at doing, is to simply uh, seize any opportunity, whether it's on the street or here in the forum or back in the offices, uh, to talk with them about their experiences and their lives and uh, uh, see if there's some relation to what you want to do with your life. Uh, but it is really an opportunity to try to get up close to some folks with some uh, uh, rather extraordinary experiences in American society. Uh, and uh, I'm sure they'll be learning a lot from you in that process as well. Indeed, it was already clear to me from the very brief conversations we've had in the last few days with the folks before you that I suspect among them you will find at least one person who knows, uh, they, among them they know probably every prominent political activist in the United States today. Not each of them knows them all, <laughs> but I think you'll find that the, uh, the range of their experiences has brought them in contact <clears throat> with a lot of folks uh, besides their own uh, of prominence uh, as well, so we hope you can learn from that. But it's my pleasure to first introduce uh, our architect uh, for this evening, uh, uh, Carl Anthony. Uh, he comes to us from California. You will notice that California, uh, like Texas last semester, is going to be very well represented here uh, this semester. <laughs> and I guess uh, I, I will probably should let the Californians speak to that, but they claim to be such a huge part of our economy and larger than most foreign countries. So. Uh, I suppose it's appropriate that they get a slightly bigger edge uh, uh, here at the forum. Uh, but Carl Anthony was uh, not only an architect, but he was head of the Planning Commission, pre president of the Planning Commission in Berkeley, uh, California. Uh, he's been a faculty member at the uh, University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he's a creator and organizer of uh, several organizations, but one in particular called Earth Island. Uh, and produces a newsletter uh, called Race, Poverty, and the Environment. Uh, he's uh, well known in uh, environmental circles for organizing on a number of uh, very key issues. Carl? Well, thank you very much, Phil, and it's really a great honor for me to be here and um, to participate in this process. Um, it's, it's a real challenge, I think, um, coming from California where we actually have weather. <laughs> uh, I, I, one of the first things that I learned when I got here was that hats, a hat is more than an ornament. <laughs> so, um, but, but I, I'm really happy to share some of my personal experiences and the perspectives on politics. I have never been an elected official, although I've been uh, on several occasions very close to being appointed to an elected office. I've served on a number of uh, uh, boards and commissions, and I generally look at politics as a, uh, an opportunity for community building. My experience uh, really was shaped very much by uh, the 1960s, where I was very deeply involved in the civil rights movement. And, uh, and at the time that I was a student at Columbia University, um, I was also very much involved in uh, events, both in the South and in the North. And I found it very difficult to put those two sets of experiences together. I went to, chose the field of architecture because I had hoped that I would be able to use those skills to help the people who live in the inner city address some of the major conflicts that they had to face. And when I came out, I realized that I had the competence and the expertise to build very expensive houses for very wealthy people and corporate headquarters for, um, for very um, well-established uh, companies, but that the competence that I had would not really be able to help me deal with it 
the issues of rats and roaches and code violations and the fact that people were living in communities without heat when the temperature was not four, four degrees below zero, but cold. Uh, and so I've viewed politics really as, a, as a, an, a bridge, an opportunity to bring different constituencies together. I want to share just one experience, which I've mentioned several times since I've been here, as typical of many of the kinds of issues that, that I've addressed. And that has to do with the question of the relationships between jobs and the environment. Uh, several years ago, when I was appointed to the Planning Commission, the city of uh, Berkeley was uh, facing a major crisis because the whole industrial section of the city was 160 uh, blocks, which was the economic engine of the city, uh, had been an area where uh, blue-collar jobs were being protected. The manufacturing in that area uh, was the source of most of the blue-collar jobs for the community. In the meantime, because of the way the development had begun to happen in that part of the community, um, a number of people had moved in with live-work housing. They uh, liked the idea of living in an industrial area, and they found themselves um, enjoying th this atmosphere. But shortly after they lived there for a while and they started to begin to, to raise families, they began to discover that they didn't necessarily like the way the fumes from the factories affected their children. They were very upset about the vibrations in their houses uh, and very upset about issues of health and safety of their communities. And this huge problem opened up for the city of what to do about protecting these manufacturing jobs in a context in which people were coming forward saying that they really were very much concerned about air quality and environmental issues. So uh, the person who appointed me to the city council <coughs> was a person for whom both the issues of the environment and the issues of social justice were very central. And she appointed me and, and um, gave me instructions to make it come out right. That was the basic uh, set of instructions that was given. Um, and so, but we did. We actually went to uh, the, the, there was, a, there was a, um, a pattern that was beginning to emerge where the, the union people and the labor people uh, were charging the environmentalists with racism. And on the environmental side, people were saying, hey, we have a right to breathe. We have a right to uh, not be uh, confronted with all this toxic pollution. And so we went to the, la the labor people and, and asked them what they really wanted. And they said they wanted to save 4,000 jobs in this area. And so we got them to put a dot on the map for every job they wanted to save. And we said, if we could convince the environmental groups to support this saving of these jobs, would you support whatever environmental uh, regulations that they think is important? So the, the labor people said, sure. And then we went back to the environmental groups and we said, look, the labor people said they want to save these 4,000 good paying union jobs. If they agree to whatever environmental restrictions or standards that you want for clean air and safety and various things like that, would you agree to support the saving of these 4,000 jobs? <clears throat> well, to make a long story short, uh, they said sure. And uh, we went through a process. The first, uh, first 2,000 jobs were really easy. It took about three, three or four meetings. We had that solved. And eventually, over a long period of time, everybody came up with a solution that, in fact, saved the jobs. And today, in Berkeley, in that particular section of a city, the number of manufacturing jobs are going up, the environmental quality is going up, and it really represents a landmark opportunity to see how you can bring together issues of jobs in the environment. That is a, an example of a story that um, really, for me, is at the heart of what we have to do right now, because we do have to protect our air. No one has to, should have to choose between having clean air and having a job. Uh, the issues that I am concerned with right now, there are really two major issues that uh, are very deeply connected to me. One has to do with this question of race <laughs> and poverty environment. We'll be talking about that in the, uh, in the work study group. But I'm also very much concerned about building coalitions between people who live in the inner city and people who live in the suburbs. And we're working on ways of doing that around issues such as transportation and environmental quality. So I think that, that is my story. And I expect all of you to show up at my um, work study group. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Carl. It's now my pleasure to introduce someone that I had the opportunity to serve with in the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, Weish Fowler from uh, the state of Georgia. Uh, Weish has had a wide range of uh, political and policy experience, uh, as you will discover, as I trust you'll get to know him. Uh, he served as an alderman in the city of Atlanta. Uh, he served as was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives and later elected to the United States Senate. 
Uh, now, it used to be facetiously said by members of the House of Representatives that when someone went from the House of Representatives to the upper chamber to the Senate, that it raised the intellectual level of both chambers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, in, in Weish's case, his election to either and both chambers raised the intellectual level uh, uh, of the uh, places. But uh, I think you will also discover, if you're not a, a familiar with Weish Fowler, that he is a raconteur par excellence. And indeed, uh, uh, back in Indiana, we called that a great storyteller. But uh, he will entertain I I paid you to the nth degree. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Weishfowler. <clears throat> Phil, thank you very much. And for your, on us, you see, the director has not lost his political talents for exaggeration <laughs> or hyperbole. Um, I want to stick within the time limit. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Anthony, we have uh, just, uh, just met here, but it may be, it may be interesting to uh, a group at Harvard that uh, we, though he would not know it and I would not know it, share a lot of the same background in listening to, uh, in listening to him speak. Um, I believe, I guess the thesis of my political perspective is simply that in a democracy, politics and public service is the highest calling, bar none. That if you take your citizenship seriously, then a part of your life, if not all of your life, if you seek active elective office, should be devoted to the common good through some form of public service. Um, unlike Mr. Anthony, when I was a student, I um, was, as you can tell by my hair, um, I, Buddy Holly was my hero. Uh, I had my own band. Um, I was uh, an all-state baseball player. I was a Red Sox fan when, a um, uh, long time ago, when Atlanta was still the Atlanta world champion, Atlanta Braves were still the Boston Braves even before they went to Milwaukee. But I don't believe I ever had a political or public policy thought when I was in college. And I went to a very good school, Davidson College in North Carolina, a small school. But I don't believe that I had a serious political thought. I went into the Army, and my last year in the Army, I was in the Pentagon with a cushy desk job. And I picked up the paper, and four little girls had been blown up in a Birmingham, Alabama church by people representing the Ku Klux Klan. And in that report, and this was the Washington Post since I was in Washington, and in that report, there was a a speech by a young 34-year-old congressman from Atlanta named Charles Weltner, who made all of you politicians familiar with the one minutes that they have in the morning. And he made a one-minute speech, no longer, which simply said that this dastardly act had occurred because those who had been chosen to lead had failed to lead and that because of that we all shared the blame because responsible men and women had allowed this kind of hatred, bigotry, violence to simmer. Well, I've never been timid even in the days of my misspent youth. I picked up the phone called my congressman. This is my congressman from Atlanta. I'd never met him, didn't know anything about him. Told him who I was, that I was a young man in the Army, but I'd like to meet him. He, being a very good congressman as well as a statesman, invited me to come over and have a cup of coffee. And that was my baptism into uh, 26 years of elective life. Uh, I worked for him for a year after I got out of the Army. Then I went to Emory Law School, and having learned the lessons uh, from my congressman of organization and armed with an extraordinary mailing list, I enlisted all of those unsuspecting Emory students uh, in my first campaign for the city council. They called them aldermen then. And we uh, went, ran a citywide uh, 
election of 600,000 people for under $3,000 in my, uh, in my student-led free labor uh, <laughs> victory. I didn't cause all those. <laughs> uh, I think it's probably all downhill from there. But I want to end by just saying that uh, I uh, hope to return to those glory years when I was learning a lot more from the students than I uh, knew of myself. And I'm sure that will be my experience with you in the Kennedy School for this semester. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're also very pleased to welcome from California, uh, Leslie Goodman. Uh, Leslie has had a, a very wide-ranging experience, uh, primarily in media and politics and government. Uh, she began uh, her career in uh, television uh, as a producer in local news. Uh, she has uh, had a very extensive uh, experience in media relations. She uh, worked for President Reagan and for Mrs. Reagan uh, while they were in the White House uh, uh, in efforts to, uh, to help them and assist them uh, uh, in dealing with the media. She was press secretary to Lee Atwater, and you may know we're having the one-act play here next week uh, uh, about Lee Atwater here in the uh, forum. Uh, she was associated with the Bush Quail uh, 1992 campaign, uh, and she currently is the uh, uh, deputy communications director for the governor of the state of California, Pete Wilson, where she's part of the senior management team. Uh, and so she, you will find, I'm sure, is an extremely engaging and talented uh, individual uh, uh, who, uh, again, has a wide range of state, federal, uh, and political experience. Leslie? Well, thank you, Phil. Actually, it's great to see all of you here, and I'm delighted to say that the one thing that makes this different from political events that I've attended is that somebody had the good judgment to serve pizza instead of chicken and peas, because I thought <laughs> for a while there that we were going to do it the old-fashioned way. Um, I think that the, the best thing that I can tell you about my experience and, and to share with you is to talk about how I worked very hard um, as a young child not to be involved in politics and have come full circle to be in it up to my eyeballs, as they say. Um, I am the, the daughter of a political family, a political man, um, and my very distinct recollections as a child were being at home waiting for dad to come home at the tender age of six or seven or eight or whenever he started. Um, waiting for him to come home so that, uh, A, we knew he was coming home, and B, that the issues of the day were always a topic of discussion. And as you can imagine, at a young age like that, um, I thought that politics was a hobby or a profession. All of my other friends had fathers that did far more important things. Um, as I grew up, I learned that he was a Republican in a Democratic city of New York, so I was the outcast among my classmates. Um, but it helped me really think about my ideology and what politics was about. I spent most of my youth, as I say, running away from politics and was hell-bent on the notion that the best thing that I could possibly do by way of serving the public or serving the community was to go into communications. Um, I had a great fascination with the media and I frankly remembered them in my youth as the people that were always outside our front door when we were trying to get to school. Uh, <laughs> My version of campaigning as a child was handing out palm cards in Central Park and praying that I didn't have to go on public buses to school because there were family pictures every two years that advertised um, re-election. So I promptly moved away from New York City and ran as far as I could 3,000 miles away to California um, where I learned a lot about communications and thought that um, television was the place for me. And after graduating, embarked on a career in television that was very short-lived, only to find that the more steady paycheck for people like me at a time of great transition in television was to go into government. Now there's some question as to whether or not that's the case, especially <laughs> with government shutdowns. Uh, but in any event, um, I think everybody in politics has been shaped by personal experiences. And I've had a few that have really loomed larger than others in, in my lifetime. Um, certainly my childhood and watching somebody who I consider to be um, the essence of public service. I might also say somebody who I think is a, a poster child for term limits because 27 years later I still have a father who is a politician. We've had a great debate about that. Um, but somebody who really taught me what it meant to give back to the community. Um, as I first went to work in politics and in government, I 
started out as a, a junior person at the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and I was asked to run a public affairs program because of my television experience. And the first thing I had to do was write about home mortgages and about a Section 8 public housing program. I thought, mortgage, mortgage, that's something that my husband's going to do for me when I grow up and get married someday. I, I don't know anything <laughs> about this. But I enjoyed learning about public housing and started out um, in the bowels of an agency and was quickly tapped to work for Mrs. Reagan, who had a tough time with the New York media. Um, and I was brought to her service in trying to be helpful in talking about what she was trying to do to combat drug abuse, which was all very interesting. And I thought that I had done a pretty good job, and they called me down to the White House and said that they wanted me to work on the visit of uh, Lady Di. And I thought that that was just great. And one of my first jobs was to go into a room. This was in putting together a photo opportunity, which I was all very new to me. What is a photo opportunity and how that makes the newspapers the next day and defines the event. And these are all very precious moments. The Reagan White House was very good at telling a story through pictures. And so my job was to go in and to write down off the name cards around the table who everybody was in the order in which they were seated to provide it to the photographers, which I promptly did and diligently sat down at the typewriter and typed it all out. And it wasn't until the next morning that I realized I had had a defining event in my political life because the place card said Princess of Wales, and I spelt it W-H-A-L-E-S. <laughs> so the next morning, there sprawled out in the front of the style section of the Washington Post was Princess of Wales, oops, exclamation point. And I immediately got a phone call from the press secretary actually personally at the time, and I thought, my God, my political life flashed in front of me, and <laughs> I thought all these things were interesting, but I had no idea of the import of something like a spelling error um, to the political process. And I instantly realized that I was going to have a very short-lived career in politics. But in any event, uh, Mrs. Reagan was very forgiving, and the press secretary at the time did a great job of protecting me for the first 24 hours of wrath that we <laughs> suffered from all of the social reporters in Washington. Uh, but that was a, a <coughs> defining event for a number of reasons. Number one, it taught me just how fragile the process really is and how every day in the life of a president and every event in the life of a president or a first lady is just enormous or can be enormous. And how you don't really realize the power of the media in translating those messages and those images. And it was a, a very interesting start for me. Um, I quickly sped through and had another experience that was, I think, among the most precious experiences in politics, and that was meeting a wild and crazy man named Lee Atwater, um, a very controversial figure. I'm sure most of you have heard of him. Um, but interestingly enough, as much as I learned from Lee the lessons of politics and the art of war, I learned, again, a lesson that I never expected to learn when I first got involved, and that was some of the lessons of real life and what a politician sacrifices, in this case, not an elected official, but somebody who is engaged in politics and what he gave up um, at a very important time in his young life and when his life was finally taken away from him, how he reflected on the things that he didn't do or was unable to do. And going to work for somebody as powerful and as controversial, powerful meaning big in imagery, not necessarily in terms of the power that he wielded in the White House, um, you just, again, see how fragile the circumstances are that you find yourself in when you're working in politics and in the media. And I think that experience really helped me define the, the balance between press and politics. And here was somebody who had invited the media into every corner of his life, um, who was suddenly confronted with his own mortality. And the challenges that one goes through as a professional in, in the area of communications and asking yourself the question, do we really have an obligation to tell the press that 24 hours after a man has collapsed that he might be looking at his own mortality? I mean, do we, do we really want that to be translated to him on the national news, or do we have a reason to try and protect his privacy, and how do you turn the switch on and turn it off? Um, so that was another very powerful experience. And I guess the third, which was the biggest real-life experience, was going out to work for Pete Wilson, where I learned again about a whole different dimension of communicating. Um, when I woke up one month after being on the job and at 4.30 in the morning was thrown out of my bed in the middle of uh, Los Angeles in the middle of the earthquake, <laughs> Um, and I learned there about the power of communications and politics in a natural disaster. Uh, never in my wildest dreams did I think that I would be in a circumstance where I would have to be the link between somebody who was trying to communicate with people over information as vital as public transit routes and where to go 
um, during a disaster of huge proportions. And the political implications of that disaster were also an incredible learning experience. So I'm very um, proud that I got involved in politics, but I think I'm particularly eager to share with all of you what some of those defining events can be, how you manage them, um, how you can create them, how the, the specialists paint the pictures and mold the images and spin the stories that we all read in our papers. Because I think when all is said and done, politics is really about the power of ideas and the will to make it happen. And so I think I share with my colleagues um, the dedication to public service from a different perspective, which is how you can take the two and, and combine them to do some very meaningful things that help people in their daily lives. So I hope you'll join me. Now, our third Californian and our last Californian uh, for this evening uh, is Bush Hersenson. Uh, many of you will recognize the name. He's a very prominent uh, American political commentator. Uh, he is heard regularly on uh, radio, uh, but he's had a whole range of experience in Republican national conventions, uh, campaigns, uh, and indeed in the federal government uh, as well as in California. Uh, one of the interesting things uh, about him is that he was the, uh, I believe, literally the producer, director, script writer uh, for uh, Days of Lightning, I mean, Years of Lightning, Day of Drums, uh, which some of you will recognize as the famous film about President Kennedy. He was at the USIA at the time. That film was to be shown only abroad, and it's one of, perhaps the only, but it's one of the very few uh, uh, um, foreign films made for foreign audiences by the U.S. government that was allowed to be shown domestically. At the law at that time did not allow uh, those films to be shown within the United States, and it had to take an act of Congress to allow this one about President Kennedy uh, to be shown. Now, the Soviet government would have at the time described this as a piece of American propaganda, uh, but we, uh, it, it's a brilliant film, uh, which uh, many of us, uh, our memories are reinforced about President Kennedy, or for some of you, perhaps they're created about President Kennedy from this film. Didn't mean to focus so heavily no, on fine. that, Bruce. That's He's fine. gone on to many other kinds of, uh, of activity. It's sort of ironic that as a very prominent American conservative, he uh, uh, began with one of the uh, most extraordinary pro projections of a Democratic president. Uh, he also uh, holds the Nixon chair at uh, Whittier College. And uh, we're looking forward to your study group, Bruce. Thanks. The, uh, one of the most meaningful experiences that I've had was took place a year, a month, and three days ago, it was the inauguration of the 104th Congress. Uh, the reason that it was so meaningful is because unlike other Washington, D.C. inaugurals, this wasn't the inauguration of a man. It was the inauguration of an idea. What had happened and what is happening, I believe, in Washington is absolutely extraordinary. For the first time in my lifetime, and the second time in the nation's lifetime. We have a federal legislature that is willing, eager, to give up power and give it to the states and give it to the people. That is, giving up power is not political nature, it isn't even human nature, and it is precisely what separates our founders from founders of other nations. Uh, they were revolutionaries, obviously, and most people who win a revolution, take the power that used to be in that area of land and keep it for themselves. And that's been the history of the world, even contemporary history. Uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini took power away from the Shah and the Sandinistas took power away from Samosa and retained it for themselves. The founders did exactly the opposite. <laughs> Unlike other revolutionaries, they ensured that they would not live like kings, but rather that they would give the power to the states and to the people. But since that time, one Congress after another, and particularly in the 20th century, has gathered a little more power than the preceding Congress, and a little bit more in the Congress that follows it, a little bit more, until we have a massive, a massive federal government, which was never the intent of the founders. And what separates the 104th Congress from any other is that they could so easily have obeyed the tradition and what was expected to inherit the power of the 103rd Congress and add a little bit more for themselves. They did exactly the opposite. They cut their staffs by one third, one piece of legislation after another, a great deal of it on the very first day. 
that was for the express purpose of giving the power back to the states and to the people the one difference that they have from the founders is that the founders did not have to face a very uh... a very abrasive media which wanted to retain the power in washington dc today we're in a, in a debate over whether or not the power should leave Washington or whether it should go to the states and the, and the communities. And I just want to give one example because it's very close to me, and I would imagine of, of great interest to you, and that's education. I hope, I don't think it's going to happen, I hope that the 104th Congress abolishes the Department of Education. And the reason I hope that is because I recall what education was like in this country prior to the time there was a Department of Education. In my own state, California, we were number one in the nation public education. We now tie in most categories with Mississippi <coughs> for number 50. James Madison said that he would never put the word education in the U.S. Constitution because he believes if a federal government had any jurisdiction over education that it would, we could then easily create a tyranny. In California, we now give $4 billion to the Department of Education, and we get $3 billion back. But we don't get a, a check from the U.S. Treasury that says $3 billion. We get a little slices of checks dependent upon if we have obeyed their criteria. They will give a mammoth list saying this is what you must, must do, and one of the figures that happens to stick out is $66 million for uh, bilingual education. We have to follow D.C.'s directives in order to get our own money back. It would seem much more logical to me that Californians, and of course this would be true all over the nation, would be able to, be, to take their education dollars and send them rather than to D.C., send them to Sacramento, or even better yet, to City Hall, or better yet, to the school district or the individual school. Just before coming here, the weekend before coming to Harvard, I saw a demonstration on television in California, UCLA students, and they carried placards, and it said, education is a right, not a privilege. Uh, I also noticed that Mrs. Clinton said, health care is a right, not a privilege, and President Clinton said that clean air is a right, not a privilege. Wrong. Every one of them. Wrong. Neither a right nor a privilege. Those things are worthy, very worthy pursuits. But if you read the Bill of Rights, you'll discover that there isn't one right that the government gives you, that what the government is doing is taking away the ability to take away your right. In other words, what the government is doing in the Bill of Rights is saying what the government cannot do to your God-given or birth-given rights. Born with freedom of speech, so I'm talking. But none of you, no one, has to pay me to, to do this. You're not compelled to pay me. I can write, and no one is compelled to buy my, to, to spend money for my computer or word processor or, or, or my pen. That's up to me. The idea is not to charge anyone else for those things for which you were born. To me, the crowning achievement of this Congress, or it may not be the 104th, maybe it'll be the 105th or the 106th, would be a balanced budget flat rate tax. Because the greatest power that the federal government has is the power of the current tax code in which citizens are given rewards and punishments dependent upon what the government would like them to do or would like them not to do. This would take away that massive, massive power. I hope that I see the day, and I hope that I see it before the end of the century, that Washington, D.C., and the federal government limits itself to those things that were prescribed in the Constitution to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, and not provide for the, for the selective welfare, but promote the general welfare, as it says in the Constitution, and most important of all, to secure the blessings of liberty. I, I failed to mention that Bruce was the Republican candidate for the U.S. Senate in 1992, and indeed all of the biographies are much longer than what... Uh, uh, I'm running through here, so I hope you'll pick up the, uh, the biographical information that we have on everyone here as well. Uh, now I'm finally uh, delighted to introduce Edwina Rogers. Uh, Edwina uh, is, um, has many uh, talents and many uh, activities that she's been involved in. Uh, she most recently has been the uh, general counsel to the Republican Senatorial Campaign Committee at the time that uh, Phil Graham was chairman of the, uh, the committee. She has been a, the Western Regional Counsel to the Dole for President uh, Campaign Committee. Uh, she is currently uh, 
uh, the, about to be uh, proposed by President uh, Clinton as the Republican uh, appointee to the Federal Elections uh, Commission uh, in Washington, D.C., those commissioners that oversee the enforcement of the election law. And she's on the, uh, uh, the board of the American Council of Young Political Leaders. She uh, has helped create several uh, nonprofit organizations uh, in the country and indeed is co-publisher of a conservative magazine called Paradigm uh, 2000. Edwina, we're glad to have you here. Thanks very much, Bill. Um, like uh, Bruce here, I'm very excited about the 104th Congress also. And I remember I was working at the Senatorial Committee at the time, and I remember election night when we had so many new senators coming into the Senate. It was, um, it was very exciting. But n nothing was more exciting than the next day for me because I'm originally from Alabama, and that was the day that Senator Shelby switched parties. And there's a lot of that going on these days, and I'd like to talk a little bit about why that, that is going on in my study group. And just to take you back as to when I got involved in politics, it was when I was um, a junior at the University of Alabama in the mid-'80s, and President Reagan came to speak at the University of Alabama, and this was during the, the uh, Reagan Revolution. And um, I started thinking about politics at that time, and I, I looked into you know, the way I approach everything. I was an accountant, accounting major, and I knew I was going to law school, so I started researching it. I, I looked at the, the history of the Democrat Party and uh, the Republican Party, and I even looked uh, at the Libertarian Party and, um, you know, everything Republican Party. Uh, they were involved in the, the uh, women's movement in the 1920s and how it was the party of Abraham Lincoln. And I decided to become a Republican, and that was um, not too well thought of around my home because in Alabama at that time, in most of the elections, there weren't even any Republicans on the ballot. And this was just uh, the mid-'80s, which wasn't that long ago. And uh, so things have really changed, and everyone in my family had been a Democrat. I remember when I was very young, I asked my parents, when I was about five, are we Republicans or are we, are we Democrats? And they said, well, of course we're Democrats, you know. Everybody in Alabama is a Democrat. And uh, so up until about the age of 20, I was just a Democrat because my parents said that we were, but there was no particular reason. And uh, so I really enjoyed looking into it and researching it and then deciding that, that I would like to be a Republican. And then once I made that decision to really get involved, I felt that I needed to move to Washington. So I went to Washington and I went to law school there and got involved in the Bush campaign and served in the Bush administration at the Department of Commerce. And uh, then just kind of got involved, especially with the uh, youth groups and the women's groups. And there's uh, the story behind the magazine, Paradigm 2000, was when Kay Bailey Hutchinson was running for the Senate in Texas. And we were appalled, the conservative women in Washington, because she had been labeled as a female impersonator by very leading women's groups. And we, we couldn't figure out why this was so, because you know she was female and they should support her also. And she was the only female in that election. But groups like now would not support her. So we sat around and we thought, well, what are we going to do to help her? Because we had all, all had already given her our legal limit, which was $1,000, and we had worked very hard to getting women used to writing those checks in the D.C. area. So we came up with this idea of creating a magazine. We only had 10 days before the election. So we sat down, we wrote a magazine, and we had 10 pages on her, it had her picture on the front, and uh, we said, K. Billy Hutchison, Texas Trailblazer, and just you know went on and on about her, and then we had some other kind of conservative Republican stuff to fill out the other 21 pages, and printed about uh, 50,000 copies, and shipped it down to Texas and distributed it everywhere. I don't know if that really had any impact in, in her election, but at least we felt like that we were doing something. And um, so there are a lot of examples like that where you can get involved in politics and you can do relatively small things but it can have a pretty tremendous outcome. So that's uh, pretty much um, my experience with politics, and I'm going to continue to look for new ways to get involved, and that's one of the goals with the study group. I want to encourage people to participate in politics 
in unconventional ways. And also, I'd like to put together some proposals for political reform and take them back to Washington and share them with the Republicans in the House and the Senate, especially with regard to campaign finance reform. Thanks. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. We hope you'll seize the opportunity. Oh, oh, oh my goodness, my goodness. <laughs> Lynn, how soon we forget. My apologies. I'll remind you. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> well, well, that was a short speech. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had warned the folks to keep the speeches short tonight, <laughs> and uh, some of us are a little too eager. <laughs> but, uh, well, I'm, I'm very pleased, actually, <laughs> to be able to introduce uh, Lynn Williams, who has a very distinguished uh, a career in the uh, U.S. and Canadian labor movements. He grew up in Canada, and uh, uh, if you uh, get to hear his uh, full story, it's a fascinating uh, part of the history of, um, of the economic problems starting in the 30s uh, and uh, uh, how he worked through the labor movement. Uh, to help produce uh, change in a lot of people's lives, and he did that through the Canadian labor movement at first, and then later became president of the United <laughs> Steelworkers, most recently, just recently retired uh, from that. So he has a long and distinguished career, both within the labor movement and in the political uh, elements of that movement as well. Lynn? Well, thank you very much, <laughs> Phil. I appreciate being included in this. Uh... Absolutely. <laughs> I should tell you, I always had the endorsement of the United Steelworkers in all my elections as well. <laughs> so, that's a terrible, that's a terrible faux pas. Yeah, when, when are you planning on running again? <laughs> I have no plans. <laughs> I was thinking as, the, uh, as my colleagues were speaking that the uh, philosophical shift in this conversation was uh, getting further and further away from me. <laughs> but I didn't think I was going to fall off the other end. But... So if I may bring a little balance back into the discussion, it, it's, um, it's very tempting, obviously, to proceed down a philosophical line, but, uh, but uh, the instructions, as I understand them, uh, are that we're to tell something of ourselves. Uh, we were warned, and uh, maybe in view of subsequent events, I understand all of this now more clearly, uh, we were warned that we shouldn't start right at the back of the beginning of our lives, that there wasn't time to go through the whole thing. And, uh, and that obviously applies to someone who's rather long in the tooth like myself. Um, but, uh, but I don't know what else to do uh, if I'm to explain uh, why I find myself here. And indeed, it is a great privilege to be here and have an opportunity to spend these weeks with you and I hope engage in a great many exchanges of opinions and points of view and backgrounds and all the rest with my fellow fellows and with, uh, with all of you. But I don't know how to explain how that all came about in my case without starting at the beginning, but I'll try to be reasonable and stick within the time limit since our chairman is anxious to have this proceeding concluded. <laughs> um, I'm a Depression kid, uh, grew up in the Great Depression. My father was a Methodist minister, United Church minister in Canada. And the congregation, his congregation at that time, was in a small industrial town, the town of Sarnia, which is across the border from Port Huron, Michigan. And my experiences growing up in the Depression, uh, in, that, uh, in that milieu, uh, were ones of, uh, of uh, tramps, as we called them in those days, homeless, as we'd say today, coming around to the house and being fed by my mother. <coughs> the story was that sympathetic homes were marked on the street, and such people knew where there was a mark on the street that they could find something to eat. Uh, that uh, Christmas Eves were spent and the week before Christmas was spent uh, taking baskets of food around to be members of the congregation who were out of work and uh, all the rest of it. And, uh, of course, they were much appreciated. But I always, always felt as we were doing this and more and more as I grew up a little bit that this was a very demeaning circumstance for people to find themselves in and a very, very appalling kind of situation that we were in. The Depression was different than the difficulties, economic difficulties many people are having in our society today uh, in the sense that everybody in a little town like that was impacted by the Depression. In a very real sense, everybody was poor. Business folks and all were losing and suffering, and employment was scarce for everyone. And there weren't any big incomes around a town like that. It's certainly not very visible in any event. And so there was a solidarity in the community at that time about the common circumstance in which we all shared and a great desire to figure out what to do about it. 
And, uh, and I grew up in that atmosphere that we, have, we simply have to do something about it. This kind of a society, this sort of circumstance, the business we would hear about of plowing the potatoes underground in the West because they, there, was, there was no way to get, have them marketed and people be able to buy them. All this sort of thing was ludicrous and ridiculous, and we had to change. I remember my father running a Bible class uh, for which the textbook, uh, one of those years in the middle of the Depression, was uh, uh, Christianity, ca Capitalism, and Communism. And it gives you some idea of the atmosphere as people were seeking to figure out some answer, some response to all of this. I first found politics. Uh, I joined uh, the third party in Canada, the Social Democratic Party, called at that stage, at that time, called the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation. And I worked in my first election for that party as a campaigner, uh, for, as a volunteer, when I was 16 in 1940, uh, in a campaign to fill an empty seat in the parliament. And uh, we had a five-point program in that. Uh, in that campaign. I remember only two points. Uh, one was that we should get a national health care plan, and another was that we should get a national labor relations code like they had in the United States. I've always been very thankful that we won ultimately the first of those points and lost the second of those points. Uh, people in this audience wouldn't really appreciate that, but we succeeded in managing to greatly improve labor relations acts legislation in Canada, although we started with the same Wagner Act, very similar Wagner Act base that it began with in 1935 in America. And so I turned to politics first in order to do something about it. While I was at college, I worked for the YMCA and thought maybe social work was an answer to trying to do something about this society and, and enjoyed my work with the Y as a community organizer and all of that, but found again, I guess I've been upset about demeaning things along the way, found again that the process of charity and raising money and being dependent on what could be raised voluntarily to meet needs that were very important and significant and, and absolutely needed to be met was not a very appropriate way, from my point of view, of trying to deal with those kinds of circumstances. And I found the labor movement. And the labor movement seemed to be to me to just open up a whole new world because here was an organization that didn't depend on charity, that wasn't demeaning in any of its, any of its aspects, but was working people faced with the struggles of trying to earn a living and trying to improve their life circumstances, doing something about it directly themselves with their own organizations, with their own resources, with their own control of their own organizations, and doing it at the economic front where I don't mean to demean all the other aspects of life anything but, but after all economics is so determining in the end in terms of whether we eat and whether we live and what sorts of things families can afford and what kind of lifestyles we have are able to involve ourselves in and what aspects of the culture we're able to access, access and all the rest of the circumstances that make up a full and interesting and challenging human life. And the basis for that in our kind of a society, in our kind of an economy is really, are there, are there some earnings there? Is there something there that you can do something with? And the labor movement attacks that very issue and of course many ancillary issues. And I found the labor movement and the rest of my life was spent in the labor movement. I went to work in a plant, joined the Steelworkers Union, very shortly got a job as an organizer, spent 10 years as an organizer of the Canadian Congress of Labor, then went to work for the steelworkers. Had one interesting political experience along the way as a steelworker back in Canada when we founded the New Democratic Party, the successor to the old CCF and the party which exists today as Labor's party in Canada. I'm proud to be a founding member of the New Democratic Party. And I was involved in the region in which we had the first election. There were two elections came up to fill vacant seats and mine was in what I deemed to be a good area. The other was in a very poor area, we believed. And so I persuaded the party that as much of the resources, a great excess of the limited resources we had, should be spent in the election where I was involved. There isn't time to tell you the whole story, but the end of the story was that we lost and we won in the other, in the other election. And I was afraid to show my face around the party headquarters for about six months after that, having used up so much of the party's resources in a losing cause. I first ran for political office in my union in 1973. Uh, we have a referendum election in the Steelworkers, uh, which means that every member has a vote in the elections. In the district, every member in that regional geographical district, in the whole union, every member in the union. So while I've never sought political office in, in, in public service, and government service, our elections are very much the same. And I first ran for political office in 73, became the director of the largest district in the Union, the largest district in Canada as well, which encompassed Ontario through to the West Coast. And then in 1977, ran for international office and became secretary of the Union and moved to Pittsburgh. 
I'm obviously using up too much time, so I won't uh, tell you all the things that have happened since. I just want to recount two political experiences. One, the first one was that uh, shortly after I moved to Pittsburgh, the steel industry in America collapsed. There's no connection between those two events, I want to assure you. <laughs> but I became immediately involved in how we deal with this collapse and all the difficulty in the steel industry. And a big piece of it was the whole trade issue, which has dominated a good deal of trade union activity and politics ever since. But in terms of trying to deal with the steel trade issue, I discovered that one of our most important allies was a Republican senator named John Hines, the senator from Pennsylvania. And this was a whole new experience for me. I'd lived in very ideological politics up until that time. And here all of a sudden I was in, a, in bipartisanship in America and working on this trade issue with, uh, in a collaborative way with a Republican senator and a number of other Republicans and, of course, a great many Democrats. I'm not sure all that I learned in those years is much use today, but that's another story. I may have to go to one of the other study groups to figure that out. <laughs> But it seems to me America suddenly has much more of a parliamentary system than it had when I arrived in, uh, in the early 1980s. In any event, that was an important lesson to me. One of the other great experiences that I had, I've enjoyed since I was in America, came in a more partisan kind of a circumstance when, unfortunately, as a result of the tragic death of John Hines, Harris Wofford was appointed to the U.S. Senate. I was one of those privileged to help persuade Governor Casey after he tried Lee Iacocca to appoint uh, Harris Wofford to the Senate, and then pleased to work in Harris's election. <laughs> Back to that favorite old issue of health care, and for a while we made the health health care and how we deal with it in America a very important part of the political agenda. Unfortunately, Harris was not reelected. That doesn't mean it really mean that health care isn't it's still an important part of the American agenda, but clearly is going to be approached in a variety of interesting and challenging ways as we move move forward. Life in the labor movement and life in politics intersects on issue after issue. Very little can be done about many circumstances that American workers face without reference to the political context in which the struggles take place in terms of labor legislation, in terms of replacement workers for workers who choose to exercise their right to strike, in terms of issues like health care, minimum wage, in terms of what workers have to go through in America if they wish to organize a union. We hope to deal with those issues in my study group, and I hope uh, after or before or when in conjunction with attending the study groups of all my fellows, you'll drop by so we can discuss these challenging issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. I don't know how I could have missed that, and I want to make sure I've got nobody else here on stage uh, with us. But uh, I think you can see we have a, a diverse group of, uh, of fellows this semester with a wide range of experience on the American scene and the Canadian scene as well. And we hope you'll uh, seize the opportunity to get to know them in a personal way as well as in their study groups. So thank you very much for coming. They're going to stay around for a few minutes to uh, talk to you individually if you have some additional questions. Thanks so much.